Perhaps you think annual servicing is a good thing. Well, here are the top four reasons why it's not. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. And forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I have kicked car makers down there for failing to introduce annual service intervals, and not just once. I've done this as a consumer advocate because the delay is generally a result of dealers not wanting to see their servicing revenue cut in half. This is a big deal for a car dealer. They have tantrums about it and it is most undignified but also entertaining. The vehicles themselves can tolerate 12 month service intervals well in advance of the business plans of the monkeys who sell them and frankly that's their problem, not yours. Nobody put a gun to their head and said, be a car dealer. But thankfully, you know, most car makers have now moved to annual servicing intervals, or 15,000 Ks, which is like 10,000 miles rounded down to the nearest 5,000 Ks for the benefit of you, Retardistanis. And I love Retardistan, just for the record. It is the second best country in the world after Shitsville. That's patriotism. Donald Trump, imbecile. Creationism, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Ken Ham, he was one of ours. And you idiots took him in. Jesus. Dinosaurs had saddles, right? Because, of course, we rode them. Now that we're all caught up. With servicing, right? You have to remember, it's the time or the distance whichever occurs first. You cannot say, I've only driven 8,000 kilometres, I will wait. Unacceptable. You will void your warranty. Something expensive will break. Definitely don't do that. Play Russian roulette instead. It's roughly the same thing. So, with all of that as the backdrop, the engineer half of my brain withering away up there, is entertained often by the concept of feedback and boobies, of course, but let us remain on point for a change. Feedback is like the matrix. It is all around us. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. So feedback is like this, right? It happens all the time. You've got a system which can be anything, driving a car, an impure arrangement with the boss's secretary, whatever. You just put a box around anything, there's your system. And then you make some change to that system. And then the effect of the change feeds back into the system. And those changes change the system, often in kind of unexpected and sometimes negative ways. This is, of course, spooky and technical and metaphysical and kind of cool just like boobies. Feedback is the first problem with annual servicing intervals. Cars are so astonishingly reliable today on average that the people who own them increasingly fail to do any routine checks. The system is the car, the change is the increased reliability over time, thanks to superior engineering and technology, and the feedback is people failing to do the most basic checks because those cars generally fail to break down often enough to motivate greater interest in roadworthiness by the people actually out there driving them. We could vox pop people in the street, and I'm not talking about drug-fucked tweakers here. I'm talking people with jobs and families, you know, real responsibilities. And I can guarantee that a worrying, significant proportion of them not only never check the coolant level, the oil level, and the tyre pressures, they would not know how or where to do this. I had this guy the other day, right? He buys some late model used car, I forget. It's under warranty. He brings it home. There is a brief honeymoon, of course, and then he drives around a bend and it starts making a noise. When he's going straight, <laughs> it's all good. Bend, noise, straight, okay, repeat. The bendy noise gets incrementally worse over some period of, I don't know, days or weeks. He doesn't do any investigation. I don't know why. Maybe our hero is hoping against hope that it will just go away like that rash down there. 
It's bonkers. <laughs> there's no shame. Ultimately, there's quite a specific loud noise, followed by deafening silence, of course, and a dash full of red lights, predictably enough. That's bad. A long story short here, the engine's been running on almost zero oil, and the pickup's been sucking air when the oil fucks off under the influence of lateral inertial Gs every time he drives around a bend. That's bad. It's a five-figure repair bill. That's bad. He is very indignant, very indignant indeed. That's bad. And of course, he's looking for someone to blame. Anyone but himself. That's not bad. That's undignified. Because who buys a car without checking the oil and everything else as soon as you get it home? I get this all the time, right? My car blew up. Who may whom may I blame? How about yourself? Blame yourself, particularly if you haven't checked the water and the oil since Jesus had that big fish cookout proudly sponsored by Baker's Delight, Nazareth. How many cars do you suppose are out there right now? They're driving around and the only time that the oil, water and the air in the tyres ever gets checked is during that annual service, which is half as often as previously. Talk about opening the door to disaster. That's feedback. Opening that door, the gate, wide open. Come on through. Professor James Reason. People used to check everything regularly because cars used to break down more often if you didn't do that. It was almost a guarantee. Once a fortnight or every second time you stop at the Bowser to fill up, check those three things. Today, oil, coolant, tyre pressures. It would avert so many five-figure disasters. And cars are definitely more reliable today. There's no doubt about that. But those statistically infrequent catastrophic failures are very expensive. And perhaps you could make this a Sunday morning ritual. Unlike going to church, doing this will reduce the risk of you going to hell. Automotive hell. The second problem is the early replacement of parts. And here's the scenario, right? When I go to my local mechanic, he will say to me, mate, your brakes are getting a bit low. Come back in three months, I'll have another look, and you better budget about X dollars to replace them, and we might have to do the discs as well. There's a couple of huge advantages here, right? I get three months to budget for some job in the future, so there's that. And I don't throw away a set of brake pads or something that are absolutely okay, good to go for the next three months. You do not get these advantages at a car dealership. In fact, at a dealership, you never get the chance to talk to the guy who's actually had his hands on your car. And that's a huge missed opportunity for you to know what's going on. If you're at a dealership under an annual servicing interval slash 15,000 Ks, the go, no-go decision on replacing the brakes is predicated on do they have 15,000 Ks left on them with a reasonable margin of safety? And on the workshop floor, this decision is like if there's less than X millimetres of meat on those pads, just bone them, mate. They could be good to go for another, I don't know, 10,000 Ks. So there's a lot of early replacement of components like brake pads going on under conventional 12-month service intervals with not all that much consideration about the kind of driving your car does and how you could maybe save a few bucks between here and when those parts are actually unserviceable. It can be a pretty wasteful thing, not to mention costly and unexpectedly so, but I guess you're only paying for one service a year, so there's that. Problem number three is human nature. You know, the 12 months comes up and you push the limit just a bit. It's 15 months all of a sudden and the service is well overdue, provided your engine doesn't compose a letter to its barrister or go poopy in its trousers, you might think everything's okay. But 12 months is a limit on the time between services. It's not a broad hint to start thinking about getting that service done over coming weeks and maybe get your people to set something up with the dealership sometime after Christmas and sometime before the heat death of the frigging universe. It is a limit 
It's why they stopped putting the term safe working load on shackles and cranes and things of that nature because people thought it was okay to be just a little bit unsafe. They call it a working load limit. Now, this is that psychologically. That 12 month service interval is a limit. Finally, there's this issue of harsh operating environments reducing the service interval. People have entirely the wrong idea about this. You might think, right, that a harsh operating environment is some long drive across the country, across the Nullarbor Plain or something, or towing a boat or whatever. But in fact, one of the harshest things you could do to an engine is start the car, drive a short distance, 5Ks or something, then park, catch the train to work, and repeat this process 10 or 12 times a week, forwards and back. This is like Gitmo for engine oil, which is subject to immense chemical attack and contamination in this situation. There's a lot of combustion blow-by into the crankcase because the parts have not yet warmed up properly and therefore they are not the ideal size. So a lot of water, some unburned fuel, some sooty crap from exhaust, aromatics, whatever, they get into the oil and it becomes significantly diluted. And in that state, it does a relatively shit job lubricating the precision parts. That's bad. It's especially bad if the engine is turbocharged because turbos run very hot and very fast and they require good uninterrupted lubrication and they are kind of expensive to replace. Not to mention the fact that they will fail halfway across the Nullarbor inconveniently. If you're one of those short trip drivers who doesn't get out on the highway very often, we're not really giving the oil very much opportunity to heat up and evaporate away those cold start impurities. And that's bad. So heaven forbid, in this situation, you might actually consider doing an intermediate oil change at the six month point between those major services. It's also a great opportunity for your local mechanic to check the car's vitals. And just a warning on doing this intermediate oil change yourself. Don't. If your car is under warranty, any DIY servicing will void said warranty. And also cars are increasingly complex and this can put you back in the matrix dealing with feedback expensively. No one can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. Here's just one example of how you can be caught with your pants down. The Mazda Ford 3.2 diesel engine in the BT50 and the Ranger. It's got an oil pump that loses its prime potentially if you drain the oil and you leave the sump empty for too long. There's a maximum time interval therefore when you drain the sump. Do not leave it empty for longer than whatever. And this is in the service manual. If you don't know that and you DIY it and the phone rings just after you pull that sump plug, perhaps it's the boss's secretary keen to explain in great detail how she is currently eating a banana with her twin sister in the jacuzzi. Let's just say this process might be momentarily uplifting, but ultimately it could end very badly indeed and it's probably only $15,000 for a new engine, so there's that. You have to ask yourself if this is a worthwhile return on investment. Another thing that can go wrong DIYing it is this. Many modern diesels have an oil dilution ballpark calibration burnt into the brain of the engine control ECU to help it make the right DPF regeneration decisions. If you DIY your oil change without plugging into the OBD2 port on the car with the right computer, I'm sorry about all the acronyms, without plugging in and resetting that oil dilution point, you risk compromising the DPF, which can be pretty expensive to replace too. And in that scenario, you can't even console yourself with knowing that you have listened to the twins talk about eating a piece of fruit. Bugger. So if you've got 12 months servicing, fantastic, embrace it. It's ultimately gonna save you money if you get the details right, but do not get burned by feedback as a result. Don't forget to check the vital fluids. Don't get scammed by early replacement. Definitely don't let the servicing slide beyond 12 months 
or the distance, and definitely don't DIY it, unless of course you would like to hop, skip and jump down the road to automotive hell. 